can change the world. You know, it's really very rare that you find uh, a group that has won a Nobel Peace Prize and the Conrad Hilton uh, Humanitarian Prize, but that's Handicap International. And Beth McNairn is with us. Beth, welcome. Thank you very much. Handicap International, first off, the word handicap, that's kind of like a word that we don't say anymore. That's true. We were founded 31 years ago um, by two French doctors. And in French, these words are fine. Um, so today, we're, we're well known in our field, and so we keep our name. But it's true that we refer to persons with disabilities. We put people first. Um, rather than their disability. You know, winning a Nobel Peace Prize is fantastic, and then on top of that, the, the Conrad Hilton Humanitarian Prize, that's even more, but then I, then I became even more impressed when I started looking at the website. I had no idea you are as comprehensive as what you are. What's your main focus? Our main focus, if I had to put it in one sentence, is to prevent uh, disability and to work with people with disabilities to improve the quality of their lives wherever they live and whatever the cause of their disability. Well, well, that's huge. Is that so? You're both a research organization and an on the ground operational organization? We define ourselves really primarily as an operational organization. We were founded in a refugee crisis on the Cambodia Thai border. Um, and since then, we have evolved to dealing with many different kinds of disabilities and many different kinds of contexts. Um, but for us, um, the most important thing is the impact we're having on people's lives. Are we improving the conditions uh, in which people with disabilities are living? Is there a, a one single definition of a person with a disability? That's a good question. There's not. And that is one of the challenges we have because, as you say, if you can't count it, you can't address it. But we do know from a recent report put out by the World Health Organization that there are an estimated billion people on the planet with some form of a disability. A so, billion people? A billion people. That's, that's one-seventh of the population. That's right. That's about 15 percent. So it is an, an experience uh, that most people have uh, within their families at some point. Uh, part in the course of their lives. Um, so it's a common experience. It's one that we all share. What sets the experience apart for people in war zones or natural disasters or resource poor settings is their ability to access the care they need, their ability to integrate into their communities, and their community's ability to understand what having a disability means. Mm. Right here on Rainmakers, we have interviewed people who are working in Sierra Leone with the amputees. Uh, and then just very recently at the Clinton Global Initiative 2013, we interviewed a phenomenal young woman uh, who is working on her master's degree from the London School of Economics who has had lifelong cerebral palsy. All of those people would be considered to have disabilities, and yet they all come under Handicap International. That's right. We deal with a multitude of types of disabilities, from visual and hearing impairments to physical um, disabilities to mental health issues to developmental disabilities. So we really, our programs deal with the gamut of disabilities because people often have multiple disabilities and they live in what we call disabling situations, mm -hmm. uh, such as war and conflict or extreme poverty or places where they face violence especially for women and children with disabilities. As the executive director, do you get to, to meet some of the people who you help? I have been very lucky to travel to some of our field programs, to Haiti after the earthquake, to Ethiopia, to Mozambique, um, and it's, it's incredibly inspiring. Uh, you brought up the example of the young woman with cerebral palsy. One of the important messages that we have in terms of our advocacy is to remember all of the abilities of people with disabilities. And when we consider harnessing the strength of 15% of the world's population, or a billion people, um, in terms of their contributions to society, that's a tremendous force that we're not yet um, fully tapping into. And not to mention the caregivers of persons with disabilities as we support people to be independent and to contribute uh, as individuals, uh, those caregivers and their families are also freed up to contribute to their families and communities. So it's a really important source of economic development. Mm -hmm. By the way, you probably hear some noise in the background. That's okay. We're right here at the Waldorf Astoria in New York at the uh, Hilton Humanitarian Awards. And we're very fortunate to be talking with Beth McNairn from Handicap International. Um, let's, let's talk about some of the specific things you do. Something I was surprised about is that you deal with landmine issues. 
We do. We were founded in the midst of a refugee crisis um, and specifically um, a recognition of the needs of landmine survivors in a long and grisly um, conflict that left many people amputated and with long-term, um, lifelong disabilities. Mm -hmm. So we are the world's most comprehensive mine action organization and I can say that with great confidence uh, because we address all of the issues related to mines. We clear them from the earth, uh, we destroy them, we help communities to identify risks, so we train them, so in places uh, where there are landmines or explosive remnants of war, we go into schools and communities and train people how to spot them and avoid them and how to alert authorities. We also deal with landmine victims, um, that's making sure they have access to health, physical rehabilitation services, they may need prosthetic limbs, um, lifelong rehabilitation care, and then providing them access to livelihoods, jobs, everything that they need to live busy and productive lives, and then the advocacy around their rights as individuals with disabilities. Um, but not only that, we've been part of the international campaign to ban landmines, which won the Nobel Prize, so we're the co-winners, um, to bring this issue forward, to ban this weapon, and to get all nations to sign on, and we're still working on the United States government, um, to sign on to this man, mine ban treaty and join the, the community of nations that have decided that this weapon has no place um, amongst human beings. Wow. I'm surprised to be talking about landmines, though. We're, out, we're talking about landmines outside of Afghanistan and outside of the Middle East. We're talking about in, in other places around the world, landmines still exist. Landmines still exist, they're still being used, uh, but they are weapons with a long lifespan. They're often buried in soil or sand um, and left behind when conflicts end. So we call landmine victims and communities impacted by landmines as those living in the war after the war. So in a country like Laos, uh, we're really talking about cluster munitions, but there were millions, millions of cluster munitions dropped on that country. Um, and today we still have victims of cluster munitions. Mm. Uh, a country like Mozambique had a bloody civil war where landmines were used and I'm happy to say that Handicap International is one of the main demining agencies and in 2014 Mozambique will be declared mine free which means wow. people well, thank you to the Mozambican people who've, who've dealt with this and who are an integral part of our demining um, efforts. So that means all of that land that's been a source of danger and fear, a source of death and disability, um, will be declared mine free and can be used for productive purposes, mm -hmm. farming, schools, community life. So this is critical. Now, something that I, I know is, is underlying the surface of, of anyone with a di disability is a, a a cultural bias against them. That's right. How could anyone have a cultural bias against someone who, was, who had a limb taken away from them from a landmine? There are so many different cultural beliefs uh, and stigma that play into it, and it really depends from region to region and culture to culture. Um, but it impacts the lives of persons with disabilities uh, because they are not fully accepted as productive members of their society. And it could be hard for us to believe here in the United States where we have a lot of legislation, like the American with Disabilities Act, and a, act, and a lot of awareness about uh, disability. But in other countries, there's a lot of fear and stigma, and this is a really important part of our work that's transversal to everything that we do, uh, which is to remove that fear and stigma, to help integrate people with disabilities into their societies, and to teach their communities about disability, and to, to bring down those barriers, those social barriers. Well, but who keeps those barriers going? I mean, is there is there not leadership in, in countries saying, you know, hey, uh, we, we've had this issue before, we, we have children who have lost limbs to landmines, you know, there's nothing wrong with them other than the fact that they have lost a limb and they're getting over it. Why don't you? Well, I think there is a movement, and I think family members and close community members are a really important part of that movement in developing countries, but it also goes up to the governmental level. So there is an international treaty called the Convention on the Rights with person, uh, for Persons with Disabilities, which has outlined um, in a series of articles a framework for addressing the barriers to the full inclusion of persons with disability. And we consider this treaty called the CRPD an important piece of
purpose of what we do, um, whether it's with landmine victims or other kinds of um, causes of disability, it's important that this treaty, which has been signed by maybe 120 countries now, again, we're counting on the U.S. to ratify this treaty in the coming month. Um, this is a framework to talk about that stigma to talk about rights and to talk about access to essential services, whether it's health, schooling, vocational training, whatever it is. By the way, throughout the show, we're going to be putting up the Handicap International uh, website. So if you have uh, questions, and, and I'm sure that you do because we can't ask them all in the short time period that we have, please feel free to go to the website and you're going to learn an awful lot more. Let's tell a story. Let's talk about it. And I want to make sure I pronounced her name right. Is it Kana? Kana. Yeah. She is a young, she was a young girl who uh, was a cluster bomb victim and lost a limb as a result of it. Uh, cluster bombs are a, a particularly insidious weapon. They often look like small toys, bomblets. Um, they have a high failure rate, meaning when they drop over a large area, um, often they don't explode and people collect them uh, for scrap metal to sell and they're very dangerous and children who are often about playing or collecting water running um, errands for their families are often victims of them um, and that's part of our risk education so in the case of Kana uh, this was a a weapon that was left behind um, that was collected by her family and exploded um, she lost her leg and she is one of our beneficiaries and partners. Uh, we provided a prosthetic leg for her that gave her her mobility back and her independence. But along with that prosthetic leg comes a lifelong need for rehabilitation care and a need to replace that prosthetic leg. For a growing child, they may need a new leg twice a year uh, because it's fit to their height. An adult may need one every three to five years. So. The disability um, requires, in some cases, lifelong care um, or access to care, which can be provided locally as long as providers are trained and as long as the materials are available. Um, today she's a young woman who goes to school, has friends, and it's a great success story for her, for her family and for her community, and really for Handicap International because she's one person who tells our story and is emblematic of how a very specific kind of support um, can provide just the extra bit that a human being needs uh, to be a full member of his or her society. Um, and especially when we're talking about all the potential of a young girl like Kana, a young person. Mm -hmm. We don't want to miss her life and miss her, her potential. Yeah. And providing her with care, the appropriate care at the appropriate time, um, she will have a very fulfilling life and be a major contributor to her society. Is there a difference in working with someone who has a physical um, disability caused by an outside circumstance such as a landmine or a car wreck or something like that versus someone who was born with a physical disability? I think there can be a difference in the perception of the society of um, when you have, for example, um, a massive uh, catastrophic event like the Cambodian um, landmine victims or like the Haiti earthquake where you have hundreds of thousands of people injured at once, it becomes a more common experience in that society and it becomes a backdrop to discussing disability and to addressing the needs. And I think that when you're talking about children born with disabilities, um, there may be no one else in their community who has such a disability. Their parents may not be aware of what they can do. Um, so that's an important part of what we do, which is the early detection of disabilities for children um, of whatever kind they are to make sure that we quickly address that child's needs. And even more importantly, perhaps in the maternal and child health sphere, to address the needs of the mother uh, who may have disabilities herself um, before she gives birth. So there's an important cycle of life that we work with uh, in order to ensure that we're meeting the needs of people with disabilities and in case of young children born with disabilities, um, that we're addressing as quickly as possible those disabilities so that they can survive, so that they're well nourished, um, and so that they can achieve their, their optimal quality of life. I gotta go off our sheet right here just for a minute though because we here in Rainmakers have made a good friend her name is Angel. Uh, she is from China, and she was first discovered when uh, former President Clinton 
heard about her, that he had visited her village. And because of the stigma against people with disabilities in her particular village, she was put in a closet. Well, now she is out trying to help her entire country overcome the stigma against people with disabilities. Um, are there different regions around the world that, we've, we've touched on this a little bit, but are there different regions around the world that have different stigmas that they're in the process of overcoming? I think so. And I, I think that we talked a little bit about how disabilities can be viewed in different kinds of ways and some of the ignorance around them may relate to witchcraft or other other issues. But your, your story of Angel is a great story because it's really important that persons with disability are at the center of the work that we do and the center of their own independence. They are the best advocates for themselves. Um, and that's very important. We do a lot of work with, for example, self-help groups in refugee settings where we say people with disabilities should speak for themselves and identify their needs because they know best what they need. And in the case of children, it may also be working with their parents. But the fact that um, the young girl you're talking about has come out and become a symbol in China is part of breaking down those barriers and that stigma that we see these people as full partners in our communities. Um, and going back to the Disability Rights Treaty, the CRPD, that's really about putting people with disabilities at the center of the conversation and at the center of defining their own fate and their own future and giving them that tool, that treaty, so they can advocate to their governments, whether it's local or national, about what their needs are. So in the case of uh, disaster preparedness, it's saying we need to make whatever disaster preparedness um, program we have accessible to the blind or the deaf or the elderly or those with limited mobility. So people like Angel are really important in this movement to break down the stigma. Is all of what you're talking about, is it a maturation of, of human beings to <laughs> care for, for others who may not be perfect? Well, your word, your use of the word perfect is interesting. I wouldn't put it in those terms. I think it's a maturation of human beings to understand differences and to understand the contributions of individuals who, um, who can participate in their society. So I wouldn't use the word perfection. Um, I would use more of the terms of recognizing the abilities of people. And that's when you started this discussion about our name, Handicap International, and I said we really put people with disabilities first because you're first a human being yeah. um, and second a person with a disability. Yeah, we've got to get to some other things. Sure. I mean, if we could talk about, about this forever. But one of the things that you talked about was helping refugees, and you've been heavily involved in helping refugees in from the Syrian conflict? We have been. Uh, we are working in Lebanon, in the Bekaa Valley and out of Tripoli. We're working in Jordan. Uh, and we're working some in Iraq. And there are enormous numbers of refugees from this crisis. But there are also, let us not forget about the people who are still within Syria, uh, we call internally displaced. They've left their home community. They either are choosing to stay for a variety of reasons, or they can't leave. Um, but all of these people who are facing massive violence and massive societal dislocation, whether they're refugees or internally displaced within Syria, need basic services. They need water, sanitation, health care, rehab, rehabilitation. Um, there are mass numbers of injured from this conflict amongst the refugee population. It's an incredibly violent conflict, as you know. Um, so we're seeing terrible injuries. Um, multiple amputations in children. There's a little boy named Amar uh, who lost a leg and an arm, who made it to Jordan with his family, and we've been working with him uh, to provide him with the rehabilitation care he needs, but also the psychological support he needs um, to continue with his life in the midst of this conflict. Um, so in refugee settings, people are particularly vulnerable, um, and in a conflict like Syria, they there are just huge numbers of injuries that need immediate attention, and particularly for those amputees or those paraplegics or people with neurological damage, they need very quick access to quality care so that they don't either die or develop 
worse complications. So that's been a really important part of our work is to quickly identify those people in the refugee case leaving Syria uh, who need immediate access to physical rehabilitation and assessment. Isn't that dangerous for you and your workers? It is. And it is especially dangerous for the Syrians themselves. So I think uh, we have great national staff in each of these countries. And yes, it is dangerous work. We have international staff and it is dangerous for them. But it is a, a refugee crisis without parallel. Um, it's an, an ongoing crisis. It hasn't stopped yet. Every day there are more people injured, more people living without basic uh, needs. Um, so there's a danger inherent in our work, and I think that we all accept that as part of the humanitarian space that we work in. What's the thing in your work as the executive director, what's the thing that keeps you up at night? Well, I'm the executive director of the U.S. Office of Handicap International. We are based in France, where our international headquarters is located. And I think, like all of my colleagues within Handicap International, I think we worry about reaching people in need. Are we reaching them quickly enough? Um, are we finding them? Are they finding us? Are we able to address the multitude of their basic needs, the water, health, food, and their specific needs, um, physical rehabilitation, uh, as, uh, access to prosthetic limbs, etc., or mental health counseling. So I think what keeps me up is that there is um, an almost infinite level of need uh, that we want to meet or meet in partnership with other organizations. Then that's something that I wanted to, I've been wanting to ask about, and it's the difference in dealing with someone with a physical disability versus someone with uh, a mental disability or a brain injury. Do you deal with that as well? We do. We do uh, deal with traumatic brain injuries uh, and mental health disabilities and developmental disabilities. And there are different approaches and methodologies and different specialties that we tap into amongst our technical staff uh, who design programs with communities to address those specific needs. But for sure, you're dealing with a different set of parameters uh, in the case of, say, a child with an amputation who uh, has a, a, a set of needs versus a child with a developmental disability. Um, so we have to address our programs and tailor them to the needs and to the gaps in care locally. Uh, always working with local partners, too. That's a really important piece of it because long after we're gone, there has to be local capacity there to support the population. Yeah. And unfortunately, around the world, we have armed conflicts all over the place. And when I was a kid growing up, we would see movies and, and they would jokingly talk about people who were shell-shocked. Well, now they understand that's not funny at all. Yeah. Is that something that Handicap International deals with as well? Well, the PTSD, the post-traumatic stress disorder, is something we definitely deal with. We see it not only in violent conflict like Syria, uh, but we also see it from natural disasters. We saw it in Haiti. So it is something we absolutely address um, in a variety of settings, often in group conversations. Um, and it's a very important part of helping people to regain their not only mobility, but their independence, but their sense of normalcy in whatever their new normal is after an earthquake or after a conflict. So it's helping people to get back up on their feet and to address their trauma. Um, so I think that's that's a very important part of what we do, and it's in, integral to the well-being of, of the people involved in whatever disruptive or disabling situation they're facing. From all of the work that you do, what do you think is your greatest success? And then let's put it this way, what do you think is your greatest success yet to be? That's a great question. I think one of the greatest successes of Handicap International has been our work around landmines and uh, bringing this weapon to an end, finally, hopefully in the near future. I think also bringing the needs of persons with disabilities forward in the humanitarian context, as well as the development context, but particularly in the humanitarian context where people's social structures, social support structures are fragile. And in an instant, in an earthquake or in a conflict, they can be ripped apart. And people with disabilities are particularly vulnerable as are people with injuries. So I think one of our biggest success is putting the spotlight on that and making sure that we count 
these people in humanitarian response and in our development programs, that we meet their basic needs and their specific needs and that we don't forget about them. They are often invisible to the international community and I think Handicap International in 31 years has really brought this particular population to the forefront and said, hey, wait a minute, are we addressing the needs of people with disabilities and injuries? And are we making our humanitarian support, whatever that is, accessible to them? Franklin Delano Roosevelt was President of the United States. He had a disability, but he didn't want people to see. Um, John F. Kennedy had many, many health issues. Is, are things changing in the United States now so that a person with a, a physical disability could become president, for example? Well, we've already had a president with a physical disability, as you bring up um, the yeah, example Yeah, and who of, would talk about it, though? That's right, but that was a different time. I think a lot has changed in this country, particularly with the American with Disabilities Act and our awareness of not only the human rights dimension, this is really a human rights issue. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I think, yes, in our culture, which is um, generally a resource-rich culture, although there's a lot of inequity, as you know, um, we do have a sense of the contribution uh, persons with disabilities and we have removed a lot of the stigma but it's it's ongoing work as the disability rights community will tell you but you put that in an international context that's recess poor resource poor or where there are stigma or belief systems or traditions uh, that impede persons with disability um, from reaching their full potential and there's a lot of work to do and you, you asked me what's coming in the future and I would say um, more of the kind of work we're doing in humanitarian response and more of the kind of uh, disability rights as human rights work that we're doing throughout our programs and, and trying to get this awareness um, into the hands of donors and governments and other organizations so that they can really partner with us uh, to meet these needs. Okay, we have, I have an hour's worth of questions and I have a minute <laughs> left. Uh, so I'm going to put you on the spot. You have just been given the opportunity to speak to the U.S. President and Congress all at the same time. What would you tell them? The first two things I would say is ratify the Mind Ban Treaty, ratify the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability, join the international community which has recognized that these two issues can be dealt with and that we can put our name to these treaties. Uh, the next issue I would put forward is continue to fund generously programs that provide services to people with disabilities. And the U.S. government's been a great partner to Handicap International. They funded some flagship programs for us in places like Nepal for rehabilitation, in places like Haiti for training rehabilitation care providers. And we want to continue to see that investment in the kind of work we do. Uh, so that people with disabilities gain their independence and are part of economic and social development in their own countries. Beth, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Rainmaker believes we can change the world One life, one heart, one soul, one mind at a time